This is a special feature produced for download from ABC Classic FM's website. Due to copyright restrictions on the music, it's been edited to make this possible. Margaret Throsby with you on ABC Classic FM. Have you ever watched a goldfish in a bowl? Do you imagine it doesn't have much awareness of where it is, that it forgets from one second to the next what the other side of the bowl looks like? Think again. Our guest today, fish specialist Dr Cullen Brown, has proved that fish are not as dumb as we think. Fish are so clever, he says, that those schooled in survival skills can even teach their mates raised in captivity how to survive in the deep blue sea. We're doing fish a grave disservice by relegating them to the level of unknowing, unfeeling creatures whose only interest to us is as food. Cullen Brown is a senior lecturer at Macquarie University and he's studied, researched and worked all over the world. He won a Young Tall Poppy Award a couple of years ago. These days he has a particular fascination for Australian native fish. So if you've never given a second thought to fish, Dr Cullen Brown is here today to open our eyes and we will of course be playing music that our guest has chosen, a selection that starts with an overture by Wagner. The opening of the Flying Dutchman over to you by Wagner, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Sir George Schulte and chosen by our guest, Dr. Cullen Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Thank you. That's a, well, once we got to it, that's a good way to start the program. Tell us about it. Yeah, look, I really like the sort of rolling waves of that of that piece. As it this feels like I'm actually at the ocean as the, the waves come in to greet me. So I have a bit of an aquatic theme, but I break out of it from time to time. Is the ocean your favourite well, yes and no. Or I quite water like, generally? Yeah, water generally. You'll see I'll, I'll have a, another piece later that's all about um, water sprites, which is, for me, much more river-orientated. Mm. But um, either the ocean or the river is um, all good for me. We've been talking the last couple of days about animal welfare, and I'm interested in this uh, focus today on fish because I think that a lot of people don't give it any thought, don't give fish any thought at all beyond the fact that they like to go out and fish and catch fish or they like to eat them at dinner. Is it possible for us to get a comparison how smart fish are compared with animals that we sort of think we understand a bit like horses or dogs or cats? Yes, look, it's it's not as straightforward as you might think because every animal is unique in its own way and you have to come up with ways of testing them that are actually relevant to the animal. Um, so a lot of the work that's been done on rats and primates and these kind of things tend to come from our perspective. We test them on things that we think animals should be good at because we're good at them. So we set the benchmark based on us. Uh, but with fish, it's not quite so difficult because at least they're vertebrates, even though most people would not really consider them an animal. Uh, which they is are animals, tragic. though, of aren't course, they? Of course, yes. Mm. But the um, number of vegetarians you speak to that eat fish is kind of scary. Um, but look, we we do general learning. <clears throat> if we we can test how long fish remember things for, and we did some very nice work uh, many years ago, actually on rainbow fish when I was at uh, University of Queensland, and we looked at fish avoiding a trawl as it moved down an aquarium, and there was an escape route which was mimicking a commercial trawler, and the fish learnt to find an escape route through that trawl net in just five exposures. So. Very interesting. So the important thing then is for us to keep in mind that and it's the same in, I heard somebody very succinctly putting it in reference to literature or to television programs it was, this argument that I was reading once about how you can, um, you can say a trash program, a trash reality program isn't as good as a high-browed English BBC type documentary. Mm -hmm. But if you compare documentaries with documentaries, then you're doing the valid thing. Yeah, and exactly you compare right. yeah. reality show with reality show, then that's valid. So yeah. you should be looking at fish mm -hmm. different from, you shouldn't be saying, well, they're not as smart as dogs, for instance. Right, and um, it's very difficult to compare those sorts of things. It's like comparing like apples, apples and oranges. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. What sort of brains do fish have? Well, they're very similar to ours. Um, they develop slightly differently. Do they um, have hemispheres? Yes, exactly the same as ours. So we have left and right hemispheres, and we've been working on lateralization and laterality in fishes, which is how they use one hemisphere over the other. And um, fish are very similar to us in, in many ways, uh, but they have learnt, uh, from them we've learnt a lot of new things, like uh, different populations and different species use their, their brains differently. So it's not like uh, the original idea that all, um, all animals use the same hemisphere for analysing the same information. The fish so have showed there, us that they don't. Is their brain size in relation to their body comparable with ours? 
Um, the, the brain size is a very difficult thing to analyse. I mean, um, is it a brain that looks like a brain? It looks very similar. Um, it has obvious lobes. Um, yep. Ours, of course, is covered with a cortex, but if you took the cortex away, you would again see lobes as you do in, in most animals. Um, so, and then, do and you in are, birds too? Yes, very, very similar. Mm. Um, in fact, birds and fishes, if you looked at those brains, you could see much more similarity um, without doing anything to them, just looking at them. Are they evolutionarily related more closely than fish Slightly are? more closely, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, but again, fish are <clears throat> a little bit unique in the way their brains develop, but nevertheless, uh, they end up looking very, very similar to reptiles and birds. That's very interesting. Can they be taught to do things? Just about anything. Um, we've been teaching them Come on, to do yeah. lots and lots of different things, but there's some fantastic footage. If you go to YouTube, there's this uh, Japanese chap who's taught his goldfish to do synchronised swimming, and it's he just does hand gestures over the top of his fish tank, and the fish respond. Um, and there's more footage of goldfish playing with soccer balls and shooting hoops and all sorts of things. So so that idea of Paul the octopus judging whether the who was going to win the so, the soccer mm-hmm. wasn't such a ridiculous idea after all. No, not, not, not at all. Not whether he could judge who was going to win, the, but the fact that he actually chose to go to one side right, or the other. Yeah. And then, in fact, they probably rigged it in such a way that you know the likelihood of him choosing one side or the other was yeah, pretty very much sorted beforehand. Why is it the popular perception. Why have humans come to the point where, I mean, we have come to a point where we are very separate from the animal kingdom Mm -hmm. a lot of the time, aren't Mm -hmm. we? Unless we've got very specifically controlled pets of our own. Yeah, that's right. But we don't have any, we don't have like our forebears did. No. A relationship with animals on a daily basis. That's right. We're highly divorced from nature. Yeah. Look at most of us, you know, we stay in our conditioned home, we get in our air-conditioned car and we drive to our air-conditioned office. Some people don't even witness or experience the world outside, mm. let alone come into contact with animals and certainly not live animals. Is that to our loss, do you think? Oh, for me, definitely. It's one of my greatest loves. Is uh, So why have we animals. relegated fish to the bottom of the pecking order in terms of smartness or, or whatever? Yeah, well, there's, there's several reasons. The first, which we're discussing here, is the fact that we just don't come into contact with animals and we rarely ever come into contact with fishes. If you do come on t- into contact with fishes, it's on your plate. So obviously it's not behaving and doing anything very spectacular. Or they're dolphins in the sea. Or dolphins and and sharks and all these kind of things. You know, we fear and loathe them, but mostly it's because we just don't understand them. Well, because they're not in the same environment as we are. So, Like a dog is in the same environment that we are. Mm. That's right. And, of course, humans and dogs have come together um, a long, long, long time ago. We've been living together for a long time and we've selected for traits in dogs that make them particularly um, good companions. Mm. We certainly haven't done that in fish. Uh, But, you know, if you look at the statistics, fish are the most popular pet in the world by absolute numbers. If you look at the number of people who keep fish as pets, then they're third after cats and dogs. So as a companion animal, they're still extremely popular. And probably that's because they're easy, because you just stick them, right. in a, stick them in a bowl of water and feed them every day and that's yeah. it. And if Goldie dies, it costs you a dollar fifty, and you can buy another one. So. And if Goldie dies, you don't have much attachment to it unless you're three years old and you're very attached exactly to it. Right. But adults don't. Yeah. I mean, they just say, I'll get another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas a dog, it's really interesting to start thinking about this. Mm-hmm. Dogs we develop intense affection for mm-hmm. and they're part of the family and they have their own cemeteries and things like That's that. I mean, we've anthropomorphised yeah. them to that, that yeah. extent. Yeah. But we feel incredible emotion when something mm-hmm. happens to That's them. That's right. Yep. A goldfish, get another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very strange attitude. And it's not one that I share. I had goldfish and, and, and pets for most of my life, everything from guinea pigs to cats and dogs to goldfish to axolotls, you name it, I had it. But for me, when my goldfish died, I really suffered. And I did the whole burying ritual oh, really? in the backyard. Yeah, I know some people do that. But so you developed, a, I mean, you, you developed some kind of relationship with Yeah, your... I had great empathy with, with animals, um, but with fish, any animal really. The thing about fish is that fishing as a pastime mm-hmm. is the most, well, they call it a sport, is yep. the most popular sport in Australia. It's extremely popular and the angling societies have a big political pool as well. Um, and it's quite interesting because if 
it seems to be highly acceptable that you can go out and catch fish and kill them, but you imagine taking your little kids off into the jungle to shoot animals. I mean, it would just be completely unacceptable. Well, you can do it because you think they don't feel pain. Exactly. Yeah. And this business of... I've always had problems with people catching fish and then throwing them back because they're too mm. small. Yeah. Do they f- feel pain? Exactly the same way as we do. In fact, the pain receptors that humans have are based on uh, a fishy model, effectively. That's where we come from. From an evolutionary perspective, they're identical. And at the moment, we've moved away from whether or not they feel pain, and it's become very philosophical, and that is whether or not they respond to pain in an emotional sense. And, you know, frankly, there's no way we're going to answer that unless we can put little goldfish in special scanners. But and... that's, again, anthropomorphising fish, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's a, is, yeah. that a, is that a mistake? I think so. Look, But the trouble is that, again, humans are always used as the benchmark and we're forever comparing everything to ourselves. I mean, there are good reasons for that because, you know, I can talk to you and you can tell me exactly how you feel and whether you're feeling pain or, or what have you, even though everyone has different pain thresholds and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a touchy subject, but at least we can communicate that. With animals, it's much, much more difficult. Um, and obviously with cats and dogs, we can get a feeling if they yelp or whatever, then we get or a good idea that they're feeling And you get pain. to know your dog and your cat so well that you actually That's know right. when they're feeling sick, don't That's you? That's right. And Which is, I think, terrific. Yeah, and it's true of fish as well. If you've been watching fish for a long time like I have, I can immediately spot when a fish is unwell or feeling pain or, or something like that. So for me, there are a whole bunch of behavioural things that I can say, right, that fish is, is not right. What about a fish that's landed on the deck of the boat and flops and flaps and carries on for a while? Is yeah. it what's it? Is it feeling stuff, feeling things? Of course. I mean, the, the first thing that it's going to feel is a whole lot heavier. So, you know, all its internal organs and things will be getting squished by the pressure because in, in water they're effectively neutrally um, buoyant. In the air they're extremely heavy and this is why beached whales and dolphins die. They primarily die because they get crushed to death. Um, and the same thing happens with fish. But, of course, on top of that, they're suffocating to death as well. But that can take a very long time, up to 20 minutes. Do they feel distress? Absolutely. Yep. I mean, you can measure the stress um, hormones in their blood just the same as you would a person. And the results are exactly the same as a person. If you were drowning a person, fortunately, drowning only takes three or four minutes. But with a fish, you can imagine that process going on for 20, 25 minutes, up to half an hour, perhaps. Oh, it puts, puts you off fishing, doesn't it? Well, it does. Um, I come from a, a, a long line of uh, anglers in my family. My father's side is Scottish and we've been fly fishing since before I could probably talk, um, holding lines and catching fish. But nowadays I'm just as likely to put the rod down and put my mask and snorkel on and jump in the river or, or whatever and, and mm. watch them. And after I've done that, I can't fish anymore. Um, do fish have what could be called a culture of any kind? Yes. I mean, do they socialise yes. with each other? That's right. Look, One of the things that um, I was studying in Cambridge was this idea of social learning. And social learning is effectively watching other individuals and learning about the environment around you by, by watching. Um, and social learning, I guess you could you could look at it as a, a way of a fast or a shortcut way of getting information about the environment without having to experience things for yourselves. If you go to Chinatown, perhaps you've got a thousand restaurants, and how do you decide? You can't spend the rest of your life choosing every one. So you go to the one where everybody else is going to. That's an example of social learning. Mm. And so fish do the, exactly the same thing. And we've used live models, um, and you can even get fish to watch TV. And they can learn from watching TV. No. Yeah. So it's all so about... So their eyes can actually perceive what they're seeing on television. Yeah, totally. I mean, in fact, when we're working with fish, we use high definition um, footage because their eyes, in fact, are quite often better than ours. Um, if you look at a common freshwater fish that you find in Australia, the rainbow fish, it actually has seven visual pigments. And we only have three. So it's more than double the b- and better at us than are us. They, are they looking colours. Um, binocularly? <laughs> are um, they looking with both eyes? Do they, when they look f- at, at something straight ahead, they've got eyes on the sides of their that's head. That's right. So their their visual overlap actually is very very small for most for most fish species. And they, are they perceiving both sides at the same time? They do, and each each eye goes into the opposite hemisphere, and because their eyes are so separate. In fact, many species can move their eyes independently and look at things differently. They can be analysing two lots of information 
separately, simultaneously, simultaneously which in each we hemisphere. can't do. Well, we can, but we have a massive amount of overlap between our um, hemispheres of our brain. Yeah. So we have, not only do we have binocular vision, so just about everything we see in one eye, we also see the other eye. Our hemispheres are still divided, but we have a very, very large um, crossover. Yeah. So we share information in lots of ways. Would a single goldfish in a bowl get lonely? I think so. Um, I don't like to keep animals by themselves. Um, and nor would I keep a goldfish in a goldfish bowl. In fact, in some countries around the world, goldfish bowls are banned Why? Uh, on ethical grounds. Why? Um, largely because it's a small volume of water. And if you think about the shape of a bowl, because it curves, the surface area at the top that's exposed to the air is actually small, very small relative to the volume. So there's very little um, room for gas exchange. So the, the oxygen levels in the water will be reduced. Mm. Now, that's an obvious physiological problem, but from a behavioural problem, there's just not much space for them to do anything in a goldfish bowl, except for swimming around in circles, which they're renowned for doing, but do, what else can you do? Would they be aware of what's outside the bowl? Yes, and in fact, there's been <laughs> some very interesting conversations in various ethics uh, groups around the world about whether you should allow um, goldfish to be put into a round bowl, because if you look out through a round surface... Everything outside becomes distorted. distorted. Yeah. So, whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, I frankly don't use round bowls. All of my fish tanks are a square. Um, and but- do you move the? externals around so that they're getting a view of different things? No, I don't move externals. Well, I mean, other than the day-to-day, you know, yeah. living. Um, but I do move things internally within the tank to make it a little bit more interesting. For what, them. they have toys, do they? Well, or not they toys, have... but rocks and plants and that kind of thing. And do uh, they know when you've changed things around? Definitely. Their activity levels go up significantly. In fact, you can test this do they know uh, experimentally. Do you? Um, I think so. And if you speak to people who, who keep fish, they say that their, their fish only responds to the person that feeds them. So it's a really nice example of classical conditioning where you reward them over and over again if they respond to the appropriate stimuli. In this case, it, it'll be you. Um, I had a student who had bright red hair and she for a while was feeding our fish and uh, they only ever responded to people who had bright red hair. <laughs> so it's incredible. I mean, it really is incredible. <laughs> Let's listen to this. This is Ravel. This is what we, um, we um, should be hearing now. Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli is playing this little piece called Ondine. Why have you chosen this? Well, this is actually um, about water sprites. That uh, It comes from German mythology. But you can really hear the sort of river or, or, or creek, depending on where you come from, in, the, in this music. So I, I quite enjoy listening to this. That's lovely. That's Ondine by Ravel, and it was played by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, and it was chosen by our guest today, Dr. Cullum Brown, and we're talking about um, fish. I'd like to find out about some of the experiments you've done um, uh, now. Um, how do you devise experiments? What have you got to keep in mind when you're figuring out how to do an experiment? Well, I guess the, the main thing is you have to know your animal. I mean, that is absolutely foremost. There's know no, the animal you're testing. Quite right. I mean, there's no point in asking it to do things It's just that are either irrelevant or that it just will never be able to do. Um, and my perspective is to try and put yourself in the animal's place. Think of the sorts of things that it would in, encounter in its natural environment and then work from there. Try and ask questions that are likely to be relevant to the animal uh, and devise your experiments in such a way that the animal can tell you what it wants or what it's thinking but when it makes a choice. Is it all based on the imperatives of finding food and avoiding predators? Um, those are two very important factors. Um, I spend a lot of my time looking at anti-predator responses in, in different populations of animals. So obviously if, if fish are constantly exposed to predation, um, threat by birds or, uh, or big fishes or things like that, then they have a whole bunch of ways of dealing with that, um, including schooling or hiding or, or what have you. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of fish that have never been exposed to that and Fish is reared in captivity is a very nice example. And they just never use any of these escape 
um, choices because they, they don't have to. Or they've never had to in their own personal experience. And in many examples, they've never had to in their evolutionary experience either. So they just don't have the appropriate skills to deal with predators. Uh, and so this is why moving animals from one place to another, as we often do, even as part of our um, recreational fishing, where we rear fish in hatcheries and translocate them and, and put them into new river systems to catch them, that's exposing all of those native animals in that system to this new threat that they probably will never have come That's across That's why you again. can catch them so easily, is it? Sometimes. There's no doubt that those um, fish are incredibly hungry because they've never learnt um, to recognise food or anything in, in the hatchery. They're often fed on pellets. Um, internationally... That's a very common thing. If you look at salmon rearing and that kind of thing, which is massive both in, in Europe and in North America, it's all very, very commercial. In Australia, most of our fish are reared in a sort of semi-natural conditions where we put them in big earthen ponds. Yeah. So there's some natural food in that situation, but there are certainly no predators. Now, you've seen uh, cluey fish teach uncluey fish. Yeah, that's right. Tell me how they do that. Um, well... Learning is a very normal thing for most animals to do and fish are quite capable of doing it just like anything else. So they are exposed to something and then they change their behaviour in response so that you know they can avoid predators in the future or find food more efficiently. Normally they do that um, by themselves, but fish are very social animals. I mean, everybody's seen those amazing uh, manoeuvres that schools of fish can do. They're mesmerising mm. just like a, a flock of birds. And so there's a they huge amount related, aren't they? Birds and fish. I mean, it's not, it's not <laughs> well, true. Well, everything that, is. <laughs> no, no, but it, but closely related. Isn't aren't birds fish that fly? I mean, isn't well, it? Well, birds are actually reptiles that fly, reptiles and reptiles fly. are really hard versions of amphibians, and amphibians are just fish that crawled out of the sea. So. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me, from my perspective, everything's a fish, just with you know fur or feathers or scales or, or whatever. Or glasses like Right, <laughs> exactly. I could analyse everybody from a fishy perspective. <laughs> yes. um, but look, because the animals are very social, and p fish in particular, nearly every fish species spends some time of its life in a school or what have you. Uh, they spend a lot of time um, looking at what other individuals are doing. Of their own species? Of their own species. Um, in fact, if you can use trained individuals, um, which we call demonstrators, to help them recognise what a predator looks like and how to respond, um, what food looks like. How do um, you do this? How do you do this? Well... You, you essentially train an individual to be a demonstrator. It might take 15 or 20 exposures. You say, look, this is where the food is. It's real. Um, you can eat it because um, hatchery fish often have never seen live food before. In fact, when I was working in um, Finland, we exposed hatchery fish to a live worm for the first time. And instead of attacking it, they backed into a corner <laughs> out of like, oh, my God, it's moving. They've never <laughs> seen anything like it. And they were terrified. <laughs> and, but after a while, after, you know, 10 or so exposures, they started to come up and investigate it and they weren't scared anymore. And, of course, if they're hungry enough, they'll strike at these sorts of things. So eventually they do understand that this thing is edible. Um, and once you've got them doing that reliably, I mean, as soon as you put a, a live prey item in, they just absolutely nail it. So yeah. it takes them seconds to, to attack. Now, if you take that individual who knows that that food is really tasty and you put them next to a naive individual who doesn't even have to experience it directly, they can watch through a glass partition. And if they see that other fish attacking this prey item, they immediately know that that is potentially edible. And their learning rate accelerates massively. So what you're doing is not teaching the demonstrator fish to teach. No. You're teaching the hatchlings to learn. Yeah, effectively, what we're doing is because the, the teachers don't care. If no, the teachers. No, that it's not. It's not active teaching. In fact, active teaching in in the sense of kids going to school is extremely rare in the animal world. It's very rare. In fact, what happens don't, most of the don't time? Primates. To some extent, even that is debatable because is so? um, it could well be that the animals, the, the parents are just doing what they're doing and the, the kids are always there with the mother and they learn indirectly. But there is some evidence, for example, when cats um, bring home um, items that are still alive to their kittens, that they're 
encouraging the, the kittens to actually, you know, interact with the prey item and attack it. That's and really interesting it, that like you that. say that. I mean, we're getting off on a tangent here, but I've got a bird bath on my deck, mm-hmm. on my veranda, and I have wonderful visitors to that. And it's very busy at the moment because mm-hmm. I have to fill it all the time. I can imagine they, it's yeah. been so dry. But there are, there are, every spring there are baby... Uh, Karawongs that mm-hmm. come, mm-hmm. they make a dreadful noise. They squawk and carry on. But their parents are extremely attentive. Mm-hmm. Both parents come with the third, you know, this mm-hmm. different plumage because yep. it's only a baby. Yep. And they, for all intents and purposes, seem to be teaching the baby about sitting on the edge of the birdbath and drinking in a certain way. Yep. Would that be right or is it just that the baby's Well, it would be the baby by learning by... Well, mm, even copying is a a fairly uh, advanced kind of form of learning. And what what the interesting thing about these situations is that when animals that are closely related to humans do these sorts of things, we immediately assume that it's active learning. Yes. And that would be true or of active cats teaching. and dogs. Or active teaching, sorry. Um, but in fact, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, there's a whole swag of things that you need to make sure aren't happening things like this social learning process that we're talking about, mm. that, that, that the behaviour of the parents is changed in some way that you know, allows the children to learn more quickly. Yes. Um, so you need to demonstrate that that's actually happening and the number of times that that's actually done is very rare. It makes humans all the more particular, doesn't it? Because we do altruistically and actively teach. Mm -hmm. And it's it's altruistic, actually. It's not just our children. Mm -hmm. We'll teach other people's children what to do. So there is altruism there, isn't there? Yeah. So they, you know, altruism is one of those words, again, that's very, very controversial. Because eventually the idea is that we get something back. It might be extremely remote, like just even the satisfaction of seeing the kid learn something. You, know, you might get a flush of endorphins or something like that. So there yeah. is a reward, um, no matter how indirect or small. Yeah. Oh, golly, it's an interesting area. I, I, it really, I mean, it's fascinating. Let's listen to this. Now, this is um, something that's pretty important to you, and it's the Star Wars yes, music. Tell me yes. about this. So I think I was about four when Star Wars came out. Um, in the cinemas in Australia, and I had never been to the cinema. Um, it was a good first. Opportunity. This was an amazing <laughs> this was experience. Mum and Dad teaching you something very <laughs> absolutely <important>. amazing experience. <laughs> and to this day, my father still jokes about the look on my face as the the music started <laughs> up and the the big ships came into screen. And I still uh, have that sort of t- spine tingling experience every time I hear this music. Okay, we'll try it again. Music from Star Wars by the late John Williams and he was conducting the Skywalker Symphony Orchestra chosen by our guest today, Cullen Brown. And we've been talking about fish, but I want to know about your life. Will you tell us a bit about it? Because you've lived all over the place, haven't you? Yes. Especially in childhood. I'm not very good at staying still. Okay. So where Uh, were you born? So I was born in Hong Kong and my father worked for an engineering, a medical engineering company, but we were essentially based anywhere in, in Asia. But we also made frequent trips back to the States. So he's Australian, is he? He's Australian, but his family is uh, immigrated from Scotland. So they're the sort of the exodus when the, the coal system collapsed. And in your mum? She's about as Australian as you can get. All right. So yes. the two of them were living in Hong Kong when yes, you were born. Were all right. your siblings born there too? No. Um, I'm the eldest. And we came back to Australia briefly and my sister was born. Then we went back to Asia and my brother was born and then we came back to Australia and my other brother was born. I so see. we moved around a lot. And where else did you live besides Hong Kong? Um, we lived in Hong Kong. We lived in uh, KL in, in Malaysia. We lived in uh, the Philippines. We spent a little bit of time in Taiwan and Taipei. What's your memory of it all? Um, well, I was very young when we, obviously. <laughs> I, in fact, I was probably shocked when I came to Australia. It was all Asia was very normal for me, but... Um, when I started school permanently in Australia, um, we used to fly over for extended periods of time. Um, and I still remember being shocked at the, the amount of poverty in these countries, you know, shanty towns of cardboard boxes and cast iron roofs and things like that. Whatever they could find, they were making buildings out of these things. So that for me was extremely eye-opening and that was a bit of a shock. 
Um, when we were living in the Philippines, we actually lived in a sort of compound that was surrounded by razor wire and men with machine guns. So that was always an interesting uh, uh, experience coming out, and, out of this compound. And I, I remember going into some of the banks and they had a special place at the front of the bank where you could deposit your firearm before you went into the bank. And I used to think, wow, this just is absolutely Amazing. insane. Yeah. Um, but having said that, the wildlife and the reefs and the, you know, getting out into the villages and the traditional um, way of life is, was just amazing. Where did you develop an interest in the natural world? It was mostly over there. Um, and encouraged by what or by whom? Well, when we, when I was supposed to be at school, I missed big chunks of school because I spent time with my father. My mother eventually moved back to Australia because she was just sick of moving around and she had kids and all that kind of thing. Um, but when we eventually went over to visit Dad for extended periods of time, he nearly always took us somewhere special, an island off the coast of the Philippines or you know, some beautiful place, Langkawi or whatever. Um, and in that time, we were always in the water because it's always hot and sticky and disgusting over there. So you're in the swimming pool or you're in the ocean, one or the other. But when we were in the ocean, we had little masks and snorkels. And the fish life in, in these regions is just incredible. So I spent a long, long time when I was a little kid snorkeling around in these mm. places. So I, Translating that, though, that I mean, lots of kids have a nice experience by the seaside mm -hmm. in their childhood. Mm -hmm. But what translating that into a life's work is interesting. So what did you do yeah. at university and where did you go to university? Yes, well, look, I was never very good at school because I couldn't sit still for long enough. I was one of those kids. Luckily, they didn't have any of those drugs for ADHD or whatever. They would have. <laughs> They, they would have dosed me for sure. Um, I, I was much more interested in sport and all those kinds of things. And in fact, when I was going through my final year of school, everyone was thinking he's never going to get anywhere. Um, luckily, I went to a very nice private school. So the fact that I was just about failing everything in that school put me above the bar everywhere else. Uh, I think they did it deliberately. Um, but I did manage actually to do quite well, particularly in biology. I got way in the 90s for biology, which was about the only thing I was really interested in anyway. Mm. Um, and I did it okay in everything else. Is it true you were dyslexic? Yes, hopeless. <laughs> what does that mean then? Well, for me, I'm not, I'm not extreme. So um, growing up, I had a lot of trouble differentiating numbers and letters. I used to get things back to front all the time, mirror images. Mm -hmm. was, I could read upside down as well as I could, you know, the right way around and all these kinds of things. Are you ambidextrous? Did I read yes, somewhere? that's right. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm not extremely competent with my left, but I'm quite happy to compensate. I can kick and throw and everything with my left as, almost as well as my right. Do you play tennis with your left? No. I, look, if I have to play competitive sports, I am nearly always favour my right. Do you write with your right or your right left? Write with my right. Can you I write, can write with, with, with left? my left. Can you? <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> it's just what does that unique. tell us then? What does ambidexterity tell us? Well, it probably means that I could be smarter if I wasn't ambidextrous because... Basically, it means that the, your hemispheres, both hemispheres of your, of your brain, are controlling, to some extent, both sides of your body. So you, you don't specialise in one side or the other. Are you one of those people, and I've got a friend who's like this, who if you're a passenger in the car and you're giving directions and you say, turn right at the next and it's really a left, are you... I, I don't know left and right. And that my partner kills me when we're trying to do. I have to point one way or the other, otherwise I just have no idea. I've got a friend like that, and it's hopeless driving. Yeah, absolutely with. hopeless. <laughs> and it's the same as she's giving me directions. She needs to point because I just don't have a clue that way. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Mozart variations, the uh, the lovely Twinkle Twinkle variations. Mm -hmm. Why are we hearing this? Well, this is one of those songs that um, my daughter, who's eighteen months old, um, really really loves, and she's only just started to say Twinkle Twinkle, which mm -hmm. is very cute. Is she ambidextrous too? She is at the moment, but that's a natural part of early development. All right. So she'll choose a hand one, one day, probably right-handed. I think she'll go that way. Um, but she definitely loves Twinkle Twinkle and some of these variations are really beautiful. So let's hope that everybody likes them. The pianist Yeno Yando and uh, the theme and several of the variations from the Twinkle Twinkle variations by Mozart, Kirkle 265, chosen by our guest today, Cullen Brown, and we've been talking about fish. A fish right handed? No, they're not right handed or left handed. They are, actually. Oh, they are, yes. are they? Yes. Well, how, can it, how is it expressed? Well, mostly it's through their eyes. So the eyes are attached to the opposite hemisphere. So all you need to do is expose them to any stimulus, whether it be a predator or a novel object or 
thought you were going to say a novel. Yes. A novel, you could, give, you could use a novel if you wished, <laughs> whatever. Um, and all you need to do is look which eye they use to view the, the object. Um, you can change the context slightly. If it's maybe scary, um, they might use one hemisphere. If they think it's um, potentially edible, they might use the other hemisphere. So they switch eyes yeah. depending on the context and, and the, the information that's in, in that, in that uh, system. Are there many people in the world studying fish? I mean, would, from what you're talking about, it would seem to me that we don't know much about them. Well, it depends on what you mean. If you mean fish cognition, um, learning and memory and that kind of thing, there are very few. Um, we have a book, Fish Cognition and Behaviour, which is about to come out in its second edition, and it's got probably every major player um, involved in, in cognition in fishes, and there are probably 30 or 40, I suppose. In the world. In the world. Um, but if you Do talking, you all talk to each other? Always. Mm. It's a very small community because um, we all referee each other's work and refer to each other's work all the time. So we're building on everybody's um, experiments and, and, and results and things all the time. If you're talking about fisheries and aquaculture, massive, absolutely massive. Um, even in Australia, we have the Australian um, Fisheries Society and it has way over 700 members. Mm. Nearly all of them are aquaculture and fisheries related. Are they uh, angling people? Um, primarily industry people. Mm. So um, commercial fishery, fishing um, is a very big thing. So if you look um, in most of the government departments, they have a big uh, you know, fishing um, department that controls recreational and commercial fishing. Have we fished out our oceans around Australia? Australia and New Zealand are renowned for being amongst the best places in the world for our control of um, fisheries. That's not to say that we're completely exempt from you know, evil and mishaps and overfishing when we do. And it's largely because the models we use for deciding how many fish there are are extremely inaccurate because, I mean, we're trying to gauge what's going on in the ocean. And frankly, we don't have the faintest idea. In fact, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about our oceans. So, um, you know, it's, it's a fair bit of guesswork. And, of course, technology is moving so quickly now that, you know, by the time you're using sonars and radars and, you know, you can use GPS and you can use satellite tracking, you can just about catch any fish in any ocean, anywhere, if you really wanted to. Really? The, um, there, I know that, as far as I understand, Japanese commercial fishing vessels can just vacuum up enormous quantities of krill, for instance, can't they, in the yeah, southern oceans? Yeah, well, I mean, this is an issue... Um, about controlling fishing in international waters. Um, Australia, at least, is more or less in control of their um, ocean. I can't remember how, how many nautical miles. How far out does it I go? It's, it's some number of nautical miles, 200 nautical miles, I coast. think it is, off the coast. Beyond the shelf, where the sh shelf Yeah, so, away. I mean, this is why you get a lot of um, disagreements over tiny little islands, because mm -hmm. you think, why would people fight and start wars over tiny little islands. Well, nobody cares about the land. It's the fish. It's the 200 nautical miles around the land that's important. How many... Yeah, I know you've got a particular interest in Australian native fish. Mm -hmm. How many species are there? Wow, that's a good question. In fact, Australian native um, fish fauna is extremely depauperate because we don't have a lot of water. Uh, I'm going to guess somewhere about 120 species, 130 species. And are they all species. understood and, and written up? No. In fact, at this very moment, I've got a population of rainbow fish that I collected just in the hinterland of Cairns, and it's a new species. Um, and all we did was go to the river, put some traps in, catch them, and no one's ever worked on them before. So really? you could go to virtually any um, river system in that kind of area, in the tropics in particular, and you'll discover something that nobody's ever seen or worked on. Would the fish around the Barrier Reef have suffered in the cyclone? Definitely. Uh, the coral certainly The did, coral certainly. Um, and whether it's directly or indirectly, the fish themselves in the, in the initial impact would have been fine because they would just swim down to the bottom and get amongst the coral and that kind of thing. So the initial impact will be fine. But anything that impacts on that ecosystem in the way that it will... Um, the initial impact of the, the surge and the, and the storm and that kind of thing is the first thing. But associated with that is a massive amount of rainfall and destruction to the land. 
And the things, flows into the sea. Exactly. So mm. the big thing that's going to be a problem for the reef is actually all the detritus and all the mud and silt and sediment that comes in from the land and mm. settles down on top of the coral because it will smother it. So the coral will be damaged initially. The, the sediments may come in and smother it to some extent. And anything that lives or feeds in that environment is going to be affected eventually. I could go on asking you about fish all day. I find it the most intriguing <laughs> subject, but I think we'll have to finish there. I don't think we've got much more time. So, but we and we do want to listen to the last piece, which comes very appropriately from La Mer by mm-hmm. Debussy, mm-hmm. the third movement called "Dialogue of the Wind and the Sea." Is this old time favourite music of yours? Yes, this is um, something that I always listen to, and it's mostly because, again, you can really hear the ocean. Um, this is one of the things I think is amazing about music: the way you can reproduce natural sound and we can actually sit there and pretend that we're sitting by the sea. The dramatic music from La Mer by Debussy, the Cleveland Orchestra conducted by Pierre Boulez, the final choice of Cullen Brown, who's a specialist in animal cognition from Macquarie University. Now, Rosamund Bartlett is uh, an author of a book called Tolstoy, A Russian Life. She is not only a writer, she's a translator and lecturer. She specialises in cultural history and literature and music. And there are strong connections in the life of Tolstoy with music. He um, he knew uh, Mussorgsky, for instance. He met Tchaikovsky. But it's a most interesting book. I've read it and I'll be talking about it to Rosalind Bart- Rosamund Bartlett tomorrow. So that's Wednesday morning. Now it's time for the news. This feature was produced by ABC Classic FM. You'll find more audio of our programs, along with special features for download, on our website at abc.net.au slash classic slash audio. This is a special...